Okay, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Olive Power. I'm from VMware. Um, I was born in Ireland, but I currently live in Singapore. Um, and this is my first time in South Korea, so thanks for welcoming me to your lovely country and your exciting city. got a quite a bit of content to get through, so hopefully I keep speaking slow. I tend to talk too fast, so if I'm going too fast, feel free to put your hand up if something is not clear. Okay, so today we're going to stick to a pretty simple agenda about, uh, I'm going to use this, about, you know, what our operators, why we need them, how we start creating them, and a little bit of what next after this presentation. Okay, but firstly, I just want to give a little bit of background. Hello? Yeah. I just want to give a little bit of background about the elements of Kubernetes that we're going to be talking with about today. So Kubernetes, as, as we know, is a platform for managing containerized applications. And all the information that Kubernetes knows about and holds is stored in the etcd database, which is a distributed key store. And you can interact with that database and interact with Kubernetes all through an API. Um, you cannot interact with Kubernetes other than going through the API. And the command line to interact with the API is called kubectl. And with kubectl, you can do various commands and getting information from Kubernetes through the API, or indeed interacting and operating Kubernetes through the API, so creating pods or creating deployments and deleting them. And the main thing to know about Kubernetes is that it always strives to maintain desired state. It's, so when I talk about desired state, I, I kind of relate it back to the human body. I did a bit of science when I was younger, um, started off my career in science, so try and relate it back to that every so often. And desired state in the human body happens all the time. <clears throat> so for example, one of the kind of common examples is the body gets cold. I get cold all the time probably why I moved to Singapore, it's nice and warm. Uh, so the body gets cold, um, and the brain, that triggers a mechanism from the brain down to the body to start producing heat, produce, to start doing heat producing mechanisms, like shivering, which from a kinetic energy point of view, creates heat. And so your body temperature starts to rise, um, telling the brain that the body temperature is rising, back to what it should be. And that's continuously going around in a loop to make sure that, that the body is getting back to its desired body temperature state. And we have a similar thing in Kubernetes, and this is kind of the basis and the fundamentals of Kubernetes, is that it maintains desired state. And what that looks like in Kubernetes is that you basically declare to the system that you want your application to look a certain way. For example, a pod A to run X number of times. And then the system is coded to keep checking to make sure that it stays that way and to fix it if it's not. And it'll continuously do this in a loop. And keeping it really simple, the loop looks a little bit like this. And in Kubernetes, we tend to call it a reconciliation loop, where you tell Kubernetes what you want. You tell it it's, it's your desired state. The system checks that desired state continuously and will fix it if it's broken. And it's doing that all the time. And the systems that implement this looping mechanism are called controllers. And there's more than one of them in Kubernetes. Um, and they're basically pieces of software within the system that monitor resources of interest, whether it's a pod, where, whether it's a service, whatever the resource of interest that you wanted to check. And it would compare the desired state of that resource to the actual state it is in real life and try and reconcile both. So it'll take remediation action if something is not matching. Of course, Kubernetes has a lot of inbuilt resources, so a lot of resources of interest from the previous slide, like pods and nodes and services, etc. cetera. Um, and we talk about pods a lot in terms of maintaining the desired state in the number of pods. That's a nice, easy example to compute well, in my mind anyway. <clears throat> but you can extend Kubernetes. It's got out of the box resources, but you can add your own. And because you might want to add your own things that you want maintained at desired state. 
something other than the ones that come out of the box of Kubernetes. And these are called custom resources. They're resources that you are telling Kubernetes to look after and reconcile its state. And they're called, these are called custom resources. And now, as well as telling Kubernetes what your new custom resource is, you have to define some parameters about that resource that Kubernetes needs to check and watch. And that's called custom resource definitions. And they're kind of similar to like attributes or variables when you're talking about code. So I could have a new custom resource called Olive, whatever that may be, and I can define various definitions or attributes to do with that resource. In there, I've put Olive color, Olive users, Olive location. Um, and then these attributes are now known by the system because we've extended them onto the API of Kubernetes, so it no it's fully aware of them. And they can now be driven or queried or controlled or monitored. Uh, via Kubernetes, and you can have a look at these through the API. So if I define my custom resource and definitions as per the, the top of the slide, I can now interact with the system as per the bottom of the slide. kubectl get all of color, and will come back to me the information that I've inputted into the system. Okay, so this kind of brings us on to the first bit of the agenda, which is what are operators. So operators are a class of controllers. We've seen what the controllers are. They implement this reconciliation loop all the time in Kubernetes. But what an operator is, is that it's a controller that is monitoring these custom resources that we've added to the system. So it's, it's new technology or new functionality that we've added to, to Kubernetes. And what we're kind of doing in effect is that we're coding and packaging applications for Kubernetes. We are telling the system that we have this, this package or this script or this functionality in our system that we want to bring into the management of Kubernetes. We want, get, get, we want to use the Kubernetes principles and primitives to be able to manage that system. So it's in effect thinking of Kubernetes as the platform and you're packaging up a piece of software that is optimally packaged for that platform. So that platform can manage it and run it essentially the way the, in, in the same sort of code that the platform runs itself. I mean, packaging of software has kind of always goes full circles with whatever is the latest technology. I used to work a lot on Windows systems and we spend a lot of the time packaging up shell scripts into MSIs when MSI exec was a popular sort of packaging format for Windows. Um, and it's a similar thing. You know, we package shell, shell scripts and batch functionality into MSIs because that was a technology that was native and understood by the Windows platform. And when we talk about operators, we're packaging up software <coughs> that is native and understood by the platform that we're going to run it on, which is Kubernetes. And of course, whenever there's anything that is uh, an opportunity to make a vendor's piece of software be adopted more widely by the community, then that's usually taken advantage of. And here we have an example here of where a lot of third-party vendors or ISVs are packaging up their software as operators to, first of all, make the implementation of their software easier on the Kubernetes platform, and also to make it uh, so that uh, their technology is better understood with a better uptake. So what this means for us as an end user is all good news. It means that these vendors are thinking about Kubernetes as a platform to run their software. And they're doing the hard work for us, packaging up software that we might need in our systems, but packaging it up in a way that we can just take it almost off the shelf and consume it in an open source manner. So these vendors, and there's quite a few up here, if I just take uh, Aquasec there or CouchDB, they've packaged up the software that contains the knowledge to run the, this software, but they've packaged it up in a way that we can consume it on Kubernetes. So if I wanted to package up CouchDB myself, I would have to know implicitly how that database software works, 
how it works in a distributed system where extra pods of the database are maybe being spun up or deleted. How does the database system cope with that? What steps need to happen for that database system to be okay with pods going up and pods going down? Because normally, in my limited knowledge of databases, when you start adding instances of a database to a cluster, or a database cluster, that cluster needs to do some steps in order to realize that there's another instance of the database has been added. And it probably has to do some steps like clearing out a cache or adding the, adding the new instance, to the instance ID to the cluster. Various steps that you know, I would have to figure out and run through tests to make sure I had it all correct before I package it up as an operator. But here we have people like CouchDB saying, you know, we're the experts, we'll package it up in an operator fashion for you, so you can just take this and run it on Kubernetes. Um, and there's more. There's more people who have basically done a lot of the hard work for us. If we want to implement some sort of software, and we want Kubernetes to manage it, and we're thinking about packaging it up ourselves as an operator, then <clears throat> I would encourage you to check these public websites first to see if that software is available. And maybe even if the software that you're looking for is not on this list, it's always good to have a look at these things because it helps you to understand how these people built their operators and what sort of, what does the code look like? What does the structure look like? And it's always a good place to start. Okay, but why, why do we want to do operators anyway? Well, we want to, if we're using Kubernetes um, extensively or we're thinking about using Kubernetes extensively in the future, and it certainly looks like it's a platform that's on the up, um, then extending it to manage all of your bits of systems is a good thing because that means that you have one set of logic or one set of packaging format in your enterprise that is all managed the same way rather than having some part of your code is running in Kubernetes, some are external scripts that are running externally that maybe have to be manually invoked when something happens in Kubernetes. Uh, maybe it involves uh, extra steps that need to be done to get it, to get it running, like Kubernetes runs stuff, um, in terms of you know, the automatic reconciliation. We want to we take as much of the, the sort of manual operations that we have to do and bring them in to the management of Kubernetes because it's pretty good at managing desired state and how you want your system to be. So if you have some logic and some code that, you, that is kind of a manual step right now in your system, then it's a, it's a good logic to think to try and bring that under management of the rest of this stuff that's been managed by Kubernetes already. And it also, operators, makes it easier to deploy complex applications in Kubernetes. As I said before, there's lots of vendors who are packaging it up and taking that headache away of like, how do we package up dis distributed systems and make them work nicely with Kubernetes? Okay. Okay, so if I wanted to start writing an operator, how would I go about it? Okay, so most of the operators Certainly the ones you saw um, on the Awesome Operators page and uh, a lot of the ones before on the operator hub.io, many of those operators are written in Go. And there's a reason for that. It's because <coughs> Kubernetes is written in Go, so generally it's a good idea to write you know, your systems in the native language of the platform it's going to run on because um, the interaction um, is better with those two systems because they understand each other. But you can, of course, use other languages. I mean, Java is a hugely popular application, and so it would be a bit remiss if you couldn't write an operator in Java. And Ansible also is, a, is another way of uh, creating operators, and that's a, a lot of stuff from Red Hat um, is written in Ansible. And so the how is there. So how, how, how will we start kind of getting started in operators? 
Um, and I've just highlighted uh, the operator framework on that slide. This is an open source project which has all the materials and the tools that you need to start building operators. So, you know, you maybe the first step is to have a look at operator.io and, and the other web pages and seen some live examples of operators. And then the next step is to have a look at this framework and get the tools that you need to start building some of this stuff. Because a lot of it will be boilerplate code that you just want to put your layer of functionality on top. You don't have to rewrite every single line of code. There's a lot of templates out there. And the operator framework will kind of guide you around that arena. So part of the operator framework is the operator SDK. Um, and this software developer kit. And this provides, again, specific tools to build and test and package operators. Um, and the link for it is there, if it's visible. OK, so what does that actually give you? If you download the software developer kit and start, uh, start you know, running through the steps required to build an operator, from a simplistic point of view, these are the steps that that kit will take you through. And it's pretty obvious, the steps, but I just wanted to highlight them here. So you create a new operator project within the SDK, and you de define your new resource API by adding your custom resource and your custom resource definitions. Basically, you're telling Kubernetes what is the thing that you want it to be aware of, and what are the attributes of that thing. So when those attributes change, then Kubernetes knows what to do. And that's in the third point there. You're specifying the resources to watch. As I said, the custom resource definition that you add, that's what you're telling Kubernetes to watch. And the definitions of that custom resource are the things you want Kubernetes to watch. And if they change, you want Kubernetes to do something. And that something is the reconciling logic. So, I mean, we can't get away from the fact that it's always going to be code. There's code here somewhere. You have to tell Kubernetes in Go or Java or Ansible what you want it to do when the state of your resource changes. And then it helps you to build that operator. OK. So what next? I've put some resources up here that I find are really, really useful. The first link is from Core OS. And these, this was the company um, actually acquired by Red Hat. But, but um, when it was still Core OS, this is the company that came up with the term operator, where they define it as building in operational knowledge into code, into your packages on Kubernetes. So if you're going to start having reading, I'd, I'd suggest that's the first one, because they came up with the whole concept and the name. And then, as I said to you before, I've showed the link already. Um, there's awesome operators, which gives you a whole list of like free code that people have written already. And then the last one is a, a blog post by my, co my colleague. Uh, both of us are ex-Heptio. Um, we got acquired by VMware. But he's written a really nice blog post explaining a bit uh, sort of similar to this talk about what controllers are and then what are operators on top of that. So I just want to summarize kind of what we covered today. Um, so controllers incrementally move the current state towards desired state. I mean, that's the reason, that's the code of, and the heart of how Kubernetes works. It maintains desired state. And it's the controllers within Kubernetes that do this. And there's loads of them. There's many, many of them out of the box. But operator is your own custom one that manages your code. Uh, so there, yep, so the controllers for custom, and they codify operation knowledge into Kubernetes. Software vendors can now provide best practices for running their applications on Kubernetes because they can package them up for you. You've seen it already, and there'll be more and more of this coming. And this extends Kubernetes functionality. It gets it to do what it does best, not for just its own code out of the box, but for your application-specific stuff, so that you're reducing all the time the manual steps and you're increasing your automation. Okay, that's it. Any questions? No? No? 
Okay, thanks very much for your time. Thank you.